So this morning we have um, Duane and Lauren and the team from HCF with us. Let's give them a warm welcome. Um, so we've been friends with them for a long time. Uh, they've been exceptionally useful uh, in the translocal in terms of Lesotho and the work there. I think Duane still talks about the story where he happened to sit next to me in a planning meeting and whatever they asked, I just said, Duane, Duane, Duane. And the next year he was very... <laughs> um, but uh, this morning they're not ministering to us just as a friend of mine they're part of an Ephesians 4 team and that's Jesus giving a gift to his church and so I'm really trusting God for an impartation that would sink down into our foundations they're very involved with this local church and the journey of this local church um, and also in our own personal lives have often been just just helped us and and we learned so much from them and the church that they lead um, we were there earlier this year and just had a, an amazing time of learning and growing with them and so this morning I want you to receive them as a as a gift from Jesus to the church when he ascended it's not such a personal thing between us as it is between Jesus and his bride if you can imagine him leaving a gift for his bride that would build her up, equip her, and strengthen her. This is how we want to receive it. And he does that through ordinary people like us. Um, I know they don't claim anything, but God has been using them in a mighty way. And uh, we want to open our hearts to them this morning. So as they come up, we'll release the kids to go downstairs. And Dwayne, Lauren, welcome. morning everybody and Hudson Levi and Anna welcome to you guys and off they go trust you're all doing well and uh, keeping warm it's been a bit uh, fresh here uh, lately and um, I, I'm, I was really interested hearing the reason why we've actually come from Donnie thank you Donnie so I thought maybe we were here to just introduce you guys to Donnie and Renal who's been away for a while eh? but it seems like all good eh? I'm just kidding and uh, hello to Renal. Uh, I think you're watching. Um, brilliant. It, uh, we really do love this church, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to, um, to be here again and, and to be back often and to um, build relationships with you guys as a church. And, and uh, we just get to partner in a very meaningful way together in Lesotho. We're all very involved, and uh, uh, Daniel and Renal have been such a gift to us. Man, I don't know where we would be without them. Um, Rolls and I, we, I think we would have been in, we were in trouble a few times and they've just been there for us. So I just really want to honor your leaders here and honor you guys. We, we're so grateful for you guys. Um, yeah, so that's brilliant. And I just love that, um, that word this morning. Just as I've just been praying for you guys, I, I've actually got um, Joshua chapter one here ready because I feel like exactly what Anna said I feel like there's been a preparation process and as a church you're about to move into things that God has spoken about it's a time to actually enter in you have learned his voice in, in the quiet place in the wilderness in tough times and there's a there's a season it's a new season and it's a season of moving into things you've only heard about you've heard about it you've said amen you said yes but actually in the next season you're going to see it with your own eyes you're going to touch it you're going to feel it you're going to have it surround you it's actually going to be around you and uh, I think you're moving into a wonderful season as a church and uh, it's that season of Joshua Joshua spent that time in the wilderness keeping close with Moses staying close with leadership learning and uh, Moses would be in the presence of the Lord and it said when he left uh, the glory of the Lord was on his face but Joshua would just hang a little bit longer there in the tent in the presence of the Lord there's a preparation process and then there was this moment of Joshua be strong and courageous enter into what I've always promised there's a there's a wonderful season coming I believe that you guys are entering into um, and uh, you know, the words that I feel is the Lord saying to you, don't, you know, Psalm 32, don't, don't be like a horse or a mule that I need to control with a bit and bridle. Just let me lead you. Let me lead you. And so, I, I mean, I, I just believe, guys, 
as a church this is a this is a season for you to trust god like you never have he has the best in mind for you as a church as individuals listen for his voice and just follow the nudgings follow the lead uh it's good it's good it's good for you and it's not just good for you it's good for the nations uh, i love i love the, the heartbeat of this church uh, it's it's nations it's um, you guys have a huge impact as a local church but uh yeah today it's it's interesting it's already come up is i do want to just talk about the lost and the unreached um and uh love reading stories about world war ii and just the different stories world war ii stories i've got readers digest with short stories of you know different people playing their role in world war ii and uh, i've read uh, winston churchill his own accounts on world war ii um you know churchill said history will will speak speak well of me because i intend to write it um i have read his own books it does does quite speak quite nicely about him uh, i've also read uh, some of his friends accounts and maybe a little bit less nice about him but still um, pretty good um, and then I, but my favorite are just the stories of just the individuals of of uh, just just not the you know not the the top leaders but just nurses and doctors and uh, business people and and all different people playing their role in seeing the victory come in this great war and uh, I was um, couple months ago or yeah a month and a half ago i was in i got to go to cairo uh for the first time and and uh, on the nile in cairo saw the shepherd's hotel and uh it was the shepherd's hotel that montgomery arrived uh to turn the tide of what was happening in egypt and he arrived he was the second choice the first choice died on the way and then it was suddenly just okay it's you now and there he arrived and he stepped on the sands of egypt on the runway and he quoted a psalm the lord will give us victory and it things started to turn around from that point um and uh the, i've read a story of a guy who was an actor but who looked like montgomery and so he played a role um before d-day when they were getting ready to attack the germans into france from england and they sent the actor to africa to pretend that they were going to come from there and so he did this whole deal and read his story and a fantastic adventure eventually some guys wanted some agents wanted to kill him they really thought it was montgomery but he managed to escape and just fantastic adventure and uh, stories go on of of um i remember reading about uh, two young guys in their 20s sitting in a cafe in cairo on on their time off and uh, Paddy Lee Fermer and Stanley Moss and they decide how can we really hurt the enemy like wouldn't it be fun if we kidnapped a German general like wouldn't that be funny and wouldn't everybody laugh and if people are laughing people are not afraid so let's catch it so they thought okay Crete and eventually their bosses loved it eventually it went up to Churchill he loved the idea and they got parachuted into Crete and they kidnapped a general and then they were thinking what were we doing because then they couldn't get off the, the island with the general and they almost lost their lives but it was a fantastic adventure they got off and uh, it's actually an amazing story because i think that german um, general was actually a believer and when you look back you realize actually that was god rescuing that general because every all the top guys on crete ended up losing their lives um, but he got rescued um, but anyway so many just incredible stories of people who just put their hands up um uh, i was watching uh, the movie we'll get to the bible just relax guys eh? just relax <laughs> eh? um i still believe in it um i was watching that movie what's it ford versus ferrari if anyone's seen it and and uh you know the the ford guys just make mention of during world war ii how they turned their their ford company into building bombers for the americans like everybody turned everything their gifts their business everything that they had to the mission to see victory come and i just think about i think about us man what a mission that we are a part of guys the kingdom advancing jesus being made king and i love hearing stories of how uh, nurses doctors uh, business people everybody plays their role when they have that in mind the mission the victory businesses turn their businesses to to be about how can we see victory come and everybody plays their part and to see the kingdom come why why did people put themselves in danger's way why would people go and parachute behind enemy lines 
uh, to do this? Well, sometimes it was their people, it was their families behind enemy lines that they would go in for, or their friends, or, or they believed in it. They believed this was about freedom. You hear the accounts, they believed this was right. Um, it was actually only after, the, at the end of the war, that they actually saw the, the extent of the oppression. They hadn't quite realized until they, they um, took over Germany how the Germans were actually oppressing the Jews. It was only then that they realized how important this battle actually was. And sometimes I think as Christians, as we're going along and we're saying, yes, Lord, we know what we must do. But friends, I think there's a part of this deal that we haven't actually quite caught hold of how important what we're on about is, how important it actually is. I don't think we've quite caught, I, I'm talking for myself, how pressed people actually are by the enemy. And how desperately they need what we've got. I don't think we've quite got hold of how much in prison people are. And Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to open prison doors. I remember watching Band of Brothers and uh, it, it's based on the true stories and and there's this, this, this guy, um, Dick Winters, Richard Winters, who was their leader. And I remember the one time, he was such a great leader that, the, that he really served the guys and he loved them and he laid his life down for them. And they would do anything for him. They would go anywhere for him. And the one time, they suddenly realized they were in, in Holland and uh, they were, you know, with all these darks and whatever. And like, so over the mound, they realized there was a bunch of Germans, but they didn't realize, they kind of come across them. They didn't realize it was like a whole company of them. And, and actually how many were there and they didn't realize um, how uh, well trained these special forces really were so they didn't really know who they came against but Richard Winters there was no going back there was only going forward and so he told these guys listen when I throw this when I take out this pin and when I throw the smoke the smoke lay the smoke screen do not run until you see the smoke come out don't run until you see the smoke come out and so they listened to him and so he threw the pin took out the pin and he threw this um what do you call it a smoke grenade but the thing was dick winter started running ahead of them he didn't wait for the smoke he ran ahead and they didn't dare run until the smoke came but what it did by him running ahead was that they just couldn't wait to get that smoke because their leader had run in ahead and into danger and so there was none of them thinking we won't run in they just went running into danger because their leader was by himself and this was the kind of guy he was to lay down his life for them. So when that smoke eventually came up, they ran their, their lungs out to try and catch him and not to leave him by himself. And they ended up winning a great victory that day, completely outnumbered by the courage of their leader. And friends, I just think of our leader, our king, who ran ahead of us and laid his life down. And you know, he ran into the uncomfortable, he left heaven, he left the comfort of luxury of heaven to come to earth, to humble himself as man, to see this mission accomplished. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. But this gospel still needs to go, friends. And so, as Jesus ran ahead, friends, there should be something in us that we should want to go and be with him. That's what Paul caught hold of. And that's why Jesus said, you know, as long as you are together, remember me how? Remember me by me running on ahead of you eat this bread drink this this wine remembering i ran ahead of you and i laid my life down remember me remember me like this and and continually do the same friends there are other stories too um of occupied france of those who just closed their ears and their hearts to what was going on around and they just focused on themselves and they made friends and fraternized with the enemy just for themselves and when, when the war was won, it was a great disgrace for them. And it was a great regret for those. And I would love us for a moment just to think clearly this morning. We can think about ourselves and we can fraternize with the enemy. And we can get caught up with Hollywood and the absolute liberal nonsense of the day. And we can get caught up in how we can be nicely accepted by this world and how people might even think we're kind of cool. 
But I just want us to think clearly for a moment and just think when that day of victory comes, and it is coming, it is coming when Jesus will return or, or call us home. Friends, we don't want any regrets, right? We want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servants. That's what we want to hear. And so Romans chapter 10 from verse 11 it says, as the scripture says, Paul says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone who believes in Christ will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Every single person, doesn't matter what from which side of the tracks doesn't matter which part of the planet they're in or whether they where they are doesn't matter who they are or what their background is if they call on the name of the lord they will be saved how then can they call on the one they have not believed in how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That is the message. It's the message of Christ. And uh, this is brand new for me. I just managed to highlight out a whole lot of my notes here i don't know just right now i just quickly blackened a whole lot of notes that's pretty cool eh? maybe I'll <laughs> just yeah i thought you might be interested 1 corinthians chapter 1 18 yeah yeah just blacken out right now i'm sure there's an undo button right yes found it oh yeah we, we're all good that might that might be important later Corinthians 1 verse 18 the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God Romans chapter 1 verse 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew then to the Gentile friends the gospel still has power to do what it has always done to save souls there's no other gospel it is the gospel we don't get to change it you know today people want to change it to to fit in with the times friends as soon as you start changing the gospel it's not his gospel it's your gospel and guess what there's only one gospel that saves souls it's the gospel of jesus christ paul i mean paul says this in galatians he gets quite like he gets quite feisty as only paul can do in galatians um let's just let's just read the beginning there in chapter one let's go to galatians quickly got to love Paul this is Paul an apostle not from men nor through man but through Jesus Christ and God the Father I'm astonished verse 6 that you're so quickly deserting um, the one who called you in the grace of Christ not turning to a different gospel not that there is another one but there are some who trouble you and want to distort it and verse 11 for I would have you know brothers that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel I did not receive it from any any man nor was I taught it but I received it through a revelation of Christ now Paul you'll see even when he writes messages to Timothy um, a letter to Timothy he says Paul an apostle why, why would he say that to his close friend my dear friend who i love why does he need to remind timothy sometimes i think he would remind timothy that listen i'm called to be an apostle by, by, by jesus meaning i met him on the road he said you are going to play this role you're going to be sent to the church and you're going to give them the gospel and this is the gospel he got it straight from christ and when people came with other ideas he he, he would get so cross and he would say guys this gospel that i taught you is not man's gospel I didn't even go get it from Peter and James and John. I didn't. I got it straight from Jesus. 
Friends, we've got to stick to the real gospel, hey? This is the, that's where the power is. There's so many people who want to, you know, you want to change other things, but Paul got this from Christ, and we've got to stick to that one, the one in the Bible. Stick to the Bible, even if it has us at odds with the world. Even if that happens. But friends, guess what? This gospel bears fruit. Some people will hate it. Some people criticize, but some people will always be saved by it. It's a powerful seed and it always bears fruit. Amen. Okay, so moving on. You know, yeah, I'll delete that one again now. Maybe I was supposed to skip that one. Yeah, I'm reading about Hudson Taylor. Um, he was 16 years old when he encountered Christ. 16 years old, and from that moment, his, his, the course of his life completely changed. And at 16, he had a revelation that in China, um, generation after generation of people were going to hell because no one was preaching the gospel to them, the true gospel. You know, today, um, we don't hear a lot about hell, though Jesus spoke quite a lot about it. You know, you talk to Christians today, we've got, you know, we've graduated from Jesus and surely God is so loving that there's no hell, right? If there was no hell, then Jesus didn't need to die. It wouldn't have been that urgent to save us from something. It was urgent for him to come to save us from something so terrible that wasn't actually made for us. But because we've rejected him, we've set ourselves on a collision course for that. That's why he came and that's why he came urgently hell is real and Hudson Taylor from that moment 16 years old started prepping his life to save money to be a doctor to go to China so that everybody in China would hear the gospel that was his goal that was his goal <laughs> and so off he went so many guys came and joined him. There was even a guy, C.T. Studd, who used to open the batting for England with that, uh, that guy with the huge beard, W.G. Grace, if you're a cricket fan. He's, he's a, he, you know, anyway, let's not divert into the ashes. But he left opening the bat for, for England, being a famous cricketer, to go and join Hudson Taylor, and then ended up in Africa preaching the gospel in the Congo. Guys just laid down their lives to come to see the, see the gospel go out. I remember I was about 15 years old. I was in Zambia, dragged along on a mission trip. I didn't really desire to go, and my dad took me with him. And the Lord met me there. And I remember from that moment, I just knew that the rest of my life is going to be given to seeing people come to Christ and to see the bride ready and to see as many people come. Lord, my life is yours. As many people as, as you can use me to bring with that's who we're going to take. I was, um, yeah, I got to, as I said, go to Egypt in the last couple of months um, on a trip there and to go on a little boat ride on the Nile and, you know, you think about the Nile and just look at the bulrushes and you think of Moses in a basket there of papyrus and, and just all, this, all the stories that go on and just thinking about Moses and and uh, Acts chapter 7, um, Exodus 2 and Hebrews 11 have quite a lot to say about Moses and, and, uh, and his whole story. And it says here in Acts 7 verse 20, as Stephen talks about Moses, says, At the time Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child, for three months he was cared for by his family. And when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and in action. And when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. And Moses, uh, history tells us, had, uh, had, um, you know, would have studied at the Temple of the Sun, which is really the Oxford of the ancient world. And by 30 years old, he'd won a smashing victory over the Ethiopians as a general of the Egyptian army. He was a mighty man in action and in, in word and in deed. And uh, Josephus even says that, Moses was actually being prepared to be the next Pharaoh. They were preparing him. He was an incredible, incredible guy. And uh, verse 25, Moses then um, goes down, decides to visit his own people. And says in verse 25, that Moses thought 
that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Moses knew what God's plan for his life was. He knew that God was going to use him to rescue this people. But he did it his way. Someone ended up getting hurt. Someone ended up getting killed. Moses ended up running. Um, Hebrews 11 verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, it doesn't say much, but you wonder what actually went down with the story. What happened with Moses? How did that play out in Pharaoh's household? That he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses, Moses, like he, he crossed the line. He had, Joseph says he was, he was being like ready to be the next Pharaoh. He could have had whatever he wanted, yet he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Rather, mistreated with the slaves, his own people, than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He had a long view in mind. He considered reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to his reward. It says there, Moses, this is the hall of faith. He considered, and he considered rightly, that all the wealth of Egypt, which is was the greatest wealth on the planet at that stage. You think about the richest place in the world at the moment. And it could all be yours. But he considered reproach of Christ. L listen to this. In good accounting, economic thinking, if you are despised for Jesus, it's worth more than all the riches of this world. Never mind... Christ honoring you and having all his wealth. Just the reproach of Christ, just being despised for Jesus is worth more than all the treasures of the world. Isn't that amazing? This is Moses thinking clearly, guys. This is a, a very clever man trained in the best university in the world. Realizing that even dishonor for Christ is worth more than all the greatest riches of the world. Never mind the reward that's coming one day when we have the riches of Christ. Can we think clearly with Moses this morning, friends? Gone quiet here. Yeah. Thanks, Donnie. <laughs> so Moses was 40. Aligns himself with the, the, with the Jews. He thinks they're going to realize. He knows what his call is. He knows that God's going to use him to set them free. He somehow knows. And yet he tries to do it his way. It goes pear-shaped. He ends up killing an Egyptian man. The next day, two Israelites are fighting. He goes, tries to mediate. And they say, are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? He gets a fright. He thought he'd kept us a secret. None of our sins are secret, guys. So then he, Pharaoh finds out. Pharaoh tries to kill Moses. Moses runs for Midian, modern-day Syria. Saudi Arabia, rather. Modern-day Saudi Arabia. So he goes to Midian. He ends up getting married. He's 40 years old. He spends uh, 40 years in the desert. And then in Mount Sinai, there's this burning bush. And he goes up to see this burning bush. And the Lord calls him, and the Lord speaks to him, Moses, I've seen the affliction of my people. Remember, Moses knew what he was. Moses saw the affliction 40 years before. He was ready to go. Lord, I'm ready to, um, ready to do this 40 years ago. Now you want me to do it now. I mean, 40 years before, mighty in word and in deed, ready to be a pharaoh, trained general of an army, smashing the Ethiopians, now, 40 years later, like, Lord, no, I can't speak. I can't even speak. I can't do this. Ah, all I've got now is sticks in my hand. Moses knows better than anybody the power of the Pharaoh, the power of Egypt, the intimidation, the army, the, the everything. He could have been commander of it. And yet now, 
a man with a with a with a shepherd's staff. Now I must go up against these guys and set Israel free. No ways. I can't even talk, Lord. I can't do this. Moses, who gave you your mouth? Who what is in your hands? If you can just take the little in your hands, whether it's a it's a shepherd's staff or whether it's just three loaves of bread and some fish. If you can just take what's in your hand, whatever you've got. I'm not, I'm not calling you for what you don't have. I know what you've got in your hands. Can you just lay down what you have got before me and watch what I can do with what you do have? Stop worrying about what you don't have. What have you got? Lay that down before me. I can do something with that. Well, Lord, all I've got is the shepherd's staff. Well, lay it down. It becomes a snake. Remember that whole story. I can do wonders with this. Just need you to obey. The Lord actually gets cross with Moses because he keeps whining, whining, whining. I can't, I can't, I can't. Eventually, the Lord gets angry. Moses, who gave you your mouth? Who made you? Like, I made your mouth. I know what you can do. I'm the one who designed you. If I designed you, I know what I designed you for. If I'm calling you to something, I promise you, it's the perfect fit. I designed you. I made you. Jeremiah, it's interesting because it's like, he's a young man. Jeremiah, I'm going I'm to call you to speak. I'm going to call you to go and speak against Israel, against the whole nation. Lord, I'm just a youth. I can't talk. No, no, no. You're going to talk. I called you from before you were even formed in the womb. Called before you were even formed, before I even put your DNA together, before I gave you your personality, before I gave you your different talents or left certain talents out, before I did all of that, I called you, Moses. I called you, Jeremiah. I called you, Marcel. I've called you, I've called you, I've called you. I know what you've got because I gave it to you. And actually, I called you even before I gave you any of those things. Let the excuses go. Let them go. Let the whining go. Moses, I'm going to do something so special through you. St stop being like a stubborn mule and a horse that I need to put a bit and bridle with and you're going to pull along. Don't make me pull and push you along. Just go with me, Moses. I'm going to do something through you. We're going to see the power of Egypt broken. Just by you doing what, Moses? Listening to me and obeying. You don't have to, you don't have to even flex your muscles, Moses. You don't have to hit anybody. You don't have to kill any Egyptians like you did last time. Just listen to me and dare to obey. And watch what I do. The battle is mine. So Moses goes and we know the story. And I, and I love this, you know. You know sometimes I've been a little bit nervous to say yes to the Lord because of what he might make me do a lot of the time I remember um, yeah, it was about last year this time that um, Henny Cato some of you might know Henny he's a, he's a legend who's you know I think taking the gospel to every African nation there might be one he hasn't been to but maybe there's not maybe he's been to every single one and I'm not exaggerating I'm just stating facts and he's, he's been before a firing squad and he's been in an airplane crash and and different different things for the gospel and God's got him through so many stories and so when he asked to have a coffee with me I got a bit nervous and when I sat with him I just got a bit nervous because I was like this coffee is going to end up with me going somewhere that I haven't planned to go. And I just thought in that moment, I thought, Lord, I have put some conditions on serving you. I put some conditions. Lord, I'm yours completely if you use me here and there, like this and like that. 
And sitting next to him, I just knew that some of my excuses had to fall. That, Lord, I'm yours. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I want to take away the conditions because you are my king. You are my Lord. And so I knew that with that, something was going to change. I remember uh, um, you know, there was a song that really just impacted me around that time, just about I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. Just put me where you want me. I don't know if you guys have heard that song before. And uh, yeah, for the sake of the gospel, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. Just put me where you want me. And so it did. It wasn't where I expected it. It, it ended with me going and my wife going to Ethiopia together and, and to Egypt. And uh, it was just uh, uh, amazing um, going and being there and uh, just hanging with a guy like Kenny and there's another guy, Sammy, and these guys are just real, like modern day Pauls, you know, apostolic gifts, you know, they've, um, you know, Sammy for one is a guy who's, you know, done prison time for the gospel. Um, he's been beaten by a mob, kicked on the floor like a snake, he describes it, and left there. So when you're hanging with these guys, it, it, it makes an impact on you uh, because certainly I have never paid any price like that. And uh, Sammy, Sammy telling me stories, you know, just saying there's a, there's a guy I know, it's, uh, I know Donnie knows um, this guy. And this guy in his 70s phones Sammy up, says, come, let's, let me come and visit you. And um, so he flies into um, into. You know, East Africa and he says come let's go to the north and let's go visit your elders who are in jail because it was a two year period where there wasn't a moment where at least one of the elders wasn't in jail uh, for the gospel and so um, Sammy says to this guy says no man your skin color they won't like you up there they're going to throw stones at you you know it's not going to be comfortable the guy says come let's go visit your elders in jail and off they go and they travel north uncomfortably and, and this old man in the 70s goes to the magistrate and says these men are not criminals these are good men so the magistrate signs their freedom and they go to the jail and they, they go to the jail and the, the jailer says no nah, who's this magistrate <laughs> and he says actually these guys are in jail because they preach the gospel out there but now they're going to stay in jail because they've, they've brought everybody in the jail to Christ And then he, yeah, Sammy tells me they go on another trip and they, they go to the refugees and they fly. And, and this, this old guy in his 70s is sick. He's got diarrhea and they buy him medicine. Sammy buys him some medicine. And uh, they fly out into this dusty, far out place. And he goes and he fetches this man's bag and he opens it. And it's full of ladies' clothing. They've got the bags mixed up. So there's no medicine. There's no clothes. And he says, now this old man has got nothing. Nothing to sleep on. Nothing no clothes, no medicine, he's sick and they're sleeping and literally there's rock there and then by day in the heat he's just preaching the gospel um, you know, to these guys and so something of just this apostolic fervor of taking this gospel people need to know about Jesus it, it, it's got to catch you and uh, I remember hearing this story of um, this was 30 years ago that they talked about the Ganges uh, you know the Ganges uh, basin and there were as many people living in the Ganges Basin at that point as there are, as there were 30 years ago in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, there must be millions of churches, and yet there wasn't one known church in the whole of uh, um, the Ganges Basin for the same amount of people as um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so, friends, there is a difference um, between lost people and unreached people. Uh, we're also hearing about the persecuted church and uh, it's just wonderful that you have them in mind you're praying for them even going that's uh, that's fantastic but there's something that we got to keep in mind is 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 the lost and the unreached lost people are people here uh, like here in durban who don't know jesus but actually they have an opportunity to hear the gospel today on many occasions they could hear the gospel every 24 hours the unreached people are the people who on average get a chance to hear the gospel once in 30 years 
so on average, someone might hear it twice in 30 years. Someone may never hear it their whole lifetime. Um, and uh, I don't know if you know where the stats are at, but with the 8 billion people, 42% are still unreached. 42% of the world still have never heard the gospel. We're hearing the stories that people are having dreams, but they need someone to go and tell them about that Jesus. They had a dream. There's someone in, in Nagaland who, who had a dream about Jesus, and 30 years later, someone came and preached the gospel, and this old man said, I had a dream about this Jesus 30 years before this. I thought I was the only one in the whole world who knew about this Jesus. He needed to know. He needed to hear. We need to hear this gospel go out. This gospel needs to go out. Friends, there are still 2,000 languages, just, uh, just under 2,000 languages, about 1,960 or so languages that still don't have the gospel in them. It takes about a million dollars, U.S. dollars, to, to, to get a Bible done. Uh, it takes about 16 years to learn the language, get, the, get it done. Um, there's still a job for us to do. I believe Jesus is coming soon, but this gospel will be preached in every nation. And so, I mean, I love what you guys are part of. I love what we're part of. But I, I just want to say to us, can we as a church also be praying for the unreached? There's, there's, there's wonderful apps like the Joshua Project, um, the Unreached app, which every day can send you some information about an unreached people group, and you can pray every day. And as a church, would you be praying? and asking God what we can do. But guys, there's still a big part of this job that still hasn't been done. People need to know about Jesus. And so the thing that hit me about um, just hanging with these two guys in, in Ethiopia and Egypt was, was just seeing their fervor, like just their fervor in, in terms of like meeting people and saying, who are your contacts in that country? In that country that no one wants to go to, who do you know? We need to use our context. We need to see this gospel go. We've got, we've got a job to do. People need to know about Jesus. Without Jesus, they are lost eternally. There's a job to do. And friends, I, it's not just for some people out there. It's like, it's, it's, that, it's that kind of World War II picture I was painting in the beginning. Each of us get to play a role. We all play a different role. I'm not trying to put my thing on you or your thing on somebody else. But what is your role? What have you got in your hand? What has God given you? What role do you get to play? Can't we keep that in mind that there's still a big, big job to do? You see, Moses had a special understanding of Egypt and Israel. He knew Egypt like no one else knew Egypt, and he knew Israel like no one. He was the one unique guy who could play this role. It wasn't a mistake that God let him grow up in Pharaoh's household. Israel had arrived in Egypt as a large family, and now they were leaving as a large nation, a million strong. They didn't understand, they'd relied on Egyptians, government structures, organization, they'd relied on e Egypt. And now Moses, from a little boy, had had the chance to sit around Pharaoh's table and to hear the conversations and to grow up in being a general and to learn what it means to be a nation. He'd learned that. I don't think that was a mistake. Then he got to go away from Pharaoh, where he'd obviously learned to, uh, how to have a big temper and just to kill someone when things went bad. And he learned how to go and learn from a priest of God, Jethro, from a father. I remember Donnie has preached through some of the stuff, so I'm just using some of your notes here, Donnie, back at your own church. But this wasn't a mistake. Friends, what has God done with you? What's your special story? What's your special deal? What are, who are your contacts? What, what is your deal? Maybe you're Zimbabwean growing up here. Is that a mistake? Maybe not. Maybe God's doing something. Can we have our spiritual eyes open and our ears open to see what God is wanting to do? What does God want to do? Secondly, Unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers labor in vain. Friends, obedience and his timing is everything. Moses knew what God wanted to do. Use me to bring Israel into freedom. And yet he did it his way. It was disastrous. Wait for the, the voice of the Lord. Listen and obey. Listen and obey. There's no other way. There is no other way. Hear the voice of God and obey. Don't run ahead of him. Don't run behind him. It was another 40 years 
of training with Jethro before he was 80 years old. Before at the burning bush, God finally said to Moses, now go back to Egypt and bring them out of out, out, bring Israel out of Egypt. Guys, obedience is underrated. Obedience. Obedience. There is nothing like it. It is the only way. It is the only way that something actually gets done and stays done and lasts. It's the only way we move into the fullness of God. Obedience. Number three, friends, I can't, I can't, I can't. But friends, what is in your hands? Who gave you your mouth? Who gave you what you have? Don't worry about what you don't have. He knows and he wants you. You have a role to play. Number four, we have been commissioned by the great I am. God sent Moses one man against the Pharaoh and brought Pharaoh to his knees. It was God who won this great victory with all these great plagues. Friends, we do not have to be afraid what God calls us into. We don't have to be afraid where he calls us. If he calls us, he can keep us. He is the God above governments. He's the God above intimidation. He's the God who can keep us safe even in the lion's den. He is the mighty God. I, I love Psalm chapter 2. It, it's the same psalm that talks about, ask of me the nations and I'll give them as an inheritance. And it describes God on the throne and uh, the different governments of the world plotting against him. And his response, he sits on his throne and he laughs at them. Our God, we have to see, is larger, stronger. He's above, you know, we sit and we complain. We think we... We're under the circumstances of the world. We complain about different things. We don't need to complain because we are under the king and he knows what he's doing and everybody's under him and he's our father and he knows how to look after us. There's no reason for Christians to whine and complain, right? We get to have faith and to move into his plans for us. So the Psalm 32, reading from the Passion Translation. Verse 8 and 9, I hear the Lord saying, I will stay close to you, instructing you and guiding you along the pathway for your life. I will advise you along the way and lead you forth with my eyes as your guide. So don't make it difficult. Don't be stubborn when I take you where you've not been before. Don't make me tug you and pull you along. Just come with me. Just come with me. Friends, I believe God's leading this church gently into the new season. And it's an exciting season. It's going to be an adventure. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Expecting to see God do what only God does when we face crazy stuff. Winning victories. And doing mighty things. Through just ordinary people who will dare to just be led by Him. In the ESV, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. My loving eye on you. Don't be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Don't make me tug and pull you along. Just come with me. And I uh, had Joshua chapter 1 just lined up and, you know, as they move into this new season... They're going to face Jericho is the first thing they're going to do. Then AR, then all these different battles. But they're going to move into the land, but not without battles. But God says, I'm going to fight for you. He says, every place that the sole of your feet will tread, I have given to you just as I promised Moses. In verse 5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't that remind us of Matthew 28? I will be with you to the very end. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. He says, be strong and courageous. You shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all that Moses, my servant, commanded. Do not turn from the right or the left that you may have good success wherever you go. And this book of the law must not depart from your mouth. You must do everything that's written in it. You will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God 
is with you wherever you go. And verse 18, the end of it again, only be strong and courageous. Friends, the lost and the unreached are our responsibility. There is no one else coming. There's no one else coming for them. It's the church. It's us. What contacts have you got? Pray the Lord opens our spiritual eyes and ears to see what he's doing. And then we would say, Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm here. Be strong and courageous. Let me pray. Friends, there is an urgency in all of this. And if you are saying, I want to be part of, I want to be part of this. You might have said it many times before, but today again you're saying, yes, Lord. Or maybe you're saying, yes, Lord, for the first time today. Here I am. I'm going to ask us to make a bold step and stand and actually come to the front. Moses walked to the burning bush took off his shoes he remembers that day and not because there's anything special up front but just that we are making a bold step saying Lord I'm actually getting up I'm coming forward here I am I want to be part of what you're doing if that's you today why don't you get up come to the front just turn our attention to him. Anybody else? Be strong and courageous. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for everybody just saying yes to you. Would you lead them? Here they are, Lord. Here we are, Lord. Here we are. Speak to us. Let's hear your voice. Lead us. Jesus. Friends, if you're standing up front here, why not just turn your attention to him, even lift your hands and sign of surrender. And just start telling him, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. He'll lead us. There might be adjustments to make. There might be obstacles to get rid of. You I encourage you it's going to be a connection with your leadership it's going to be chatting with your leaders go to them and tell them what this meant for you today but he's going to make the way forward he's going to start to show you it might be one step at a time but lord jesus I want to thank you for everyone here take their place take their role in what you're doing oh mighty god thank you jesus thank you for your anointing lord. thank you for your presence god thank you for your holy spirit hear your voice they would hear your leading you would use them mighty use them god start preparing them i just think of hudson taylor at 16 he started he started on a very sure direction of being a doctor so that he could go to china for some of them it's that lord you make it clear i've got to go there so that i can be ready for this for others that might be actually just going straight into something but lord would you lead would you make it clear would you give their leaders wisdom as they work this out together lord what is it that you've got in mind, Lord? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, Jesus, we go for you. We go for you because we love you, because you died for us, because you not you didn't just die for us, but you died for those, the 42% you haven't even heard yet. You died for those you have heard. You died for those you haven't heard, Lord. Jesus, we love you. We love you. Everything we do, we want to do it for you, Lord, for your glory your gospel to go out in Jesus' name.